Thank you. Uh, it's on now, right? Great. So, I was trying to reproduce roughly where we left it off yesterday afternoon. So, we talked about measuring the time dependent CPA symmetry in B2J Psi K short, which is sort of this third kind of, uh, of, of CP violation that, uh, that is not that cannot be absorbed entirely in BB by mixing, but it's also not something that is attributed to the decay amplitudes, but it's really something that is connected to this phase difference between a neutral meson, say B0, decaying to some final state, and first oscillating into its antiparticle B0 bar, and then decaying through another pass, and, we're, and, 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 and we sort of wrote down or derived, or I encouraged you to derive the, 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 the expression for the time-dependent CPA symmetry. So there's a term that goes like sine of the mass difference times time and cosine delta mt. And so, of course, this lambda parameter depends on the final state. So there's a piece which describes BB by oscillations, and there is a part which connects to the weak phases in the decay to the final state. And B to J Psi K short is a particularly nice example because we said that, uh, that in this case, lambda Psi K short is to, an to, a, to a very good approximation just given by E to the minus 2i beta, where beta is one of the phases of the, sorry, one of the angles of the standard unitarity triangle over here. I'm wrong, that's alpha, sorry. And so the cases where interpreting the data is theoretically clean are the ones, so, so we know empirically, we said that uh, Q over P, the magnitude of Q over P deviating or not from one relates to CP violation in mixing. And we know experimentally that uh, in the K-on system that's a two times 10 to the minus three effect. In the B system, it's much smaller in the standard model, but we know experimentally that even in the presence of new physics, the current constraints are at the percent level. And so if uh, the magnitude of uh, lambda is equal to one, then this time-dependent CPA symmetry becomes much simpler. The second term vanishes. And if moreover, you can convince yourself that the decay amplitudes are such that terms with one weak phase dominate, so in the case of B2J Psi K short, that's B2CC by S, and we went through the, the, this tree and penguin, or so-called tree and penguin diagram contributions, which is a little bit schematic, but it's, I think it's good enough for our purposes here. Then you see that this first term, which goes like the Kabibo angle squared, this term goes like the Kabibo angle to the fourth. So, and then also these matrix elements, because it uh, starts out as a tree, plus uh, some penguin matrix elements, whereas this only has loop contributions. So one expects, in addition to the CKM enhancement of the first term, also the hadronic matrix element of the first term to be bigger than the second term. And sort of this is the, so, so if we neglect this second term, which is expected to be good to sort of at the one degree level, or one, uh, well, sorry, let's just say 1% level, then, 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 then sort of this is the, one of the cleanest examples where the, weak, where the decay is dominated by one weak phase. And therefore, this time-dependent CPA symmetry measures some complex phases in the, in the Lagrangian, which in the standard model just relate to the phase in the CKM matrix. But for example, if you had some new physics, so new physics could easily contribute to BB by mixing in a way that the magnitude of Q over P could stay very near unity, but its phase could easily differ from, from the standard model prediction, which just comes from, from, from the box diagrams for BB by mixing. And so experimentally, the measurement of, 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 of sine two beta now, and this is done by the E plus C minus B factories and recently by LHCB, it's something like 0 0.68 plus minus 0 0.02. And I just want to put this up on the blackboard to illustrate that this really has become a very precise measurement. And 
it's kind of interesting because I said in the first lecture that both LHCB and the, and the Japanese B factory will have sort of almost two orders of magnitude more data than what the current analysis are based on. So these kind of theoretical questions of what the hadronic uncertainties related to QCD processes are, are about to become important, and they will be important on the next five, 10 year time scale, because for the anticipated LHC upgrade and Bell 2 statistics, we can no longer wave our hands that we know that these terms are small. We, there, there, there needs to be some quantitative estimate of that. And, if, uh, and, and in fact, in the literature over the last couple of years, there are more and more, well, there are a number of papers with uh, different approaches and different, uh, um, using different theoretical methods to try to come up with strategies how to bound these kind of terms. Um, so, maybe I should just go permanently to the laptop. Why am I getting this? So, I apologize. So, so in the usual fits, this is the measurement of sine two beta, and that is, uh, except for the Kabibo angle itself, it's like one of the best known uh, flavor parameters experimentally. There is a very important similar process. You can ask the question, what is, you can just, just take this decay, so it was a clean, uh, uh, theoretically very clean measurement in the B sub D sector. What happens if you look at the same process in B sub S decay, so you want to look at some B sub S decay to see, so a B decay into C, C by S final state. So the simplest example of that is J psi phi. So the phi is a meson which at the quark level is an SS bias state, and J psi is the, still the C, C bias state. And much of the same, actually the exact same analysis goes through the difference is that Q over P in the B sub S case is of course a different thing because here we were talking about B sub D mixing. In this case, whatever, the, 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 the time dependent CPA symmetry uh, connect, relates to Q over P now in the B sub S sector and some different A by over A relevant to this final state But the whole theoretical understanding of it that, 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 that to a very good approximation there is no CP violation in mixing, to a very good approximation there is no direct CP violation. The relative phases of these different terms are very different in the B sub S sector than in the B sub D sector. And the reason is that, uh, so B sub S mixing comes from So, so, so instead of, uh, so, na so now you get VTB, VTS star. So instead of VTD, which in the standard parametrization has a large phase, now the mixing involves VTS, which does not have a large phase in the standard model. And therefore, actually you can, make a prediction that the time-dependent CPA symmetry in this process in the B sub S sector has to be approximately 20 times smaller than in the B sub D sector. But in terms of the theoretical uncertainties, it's exactly the same analysis. And of course, unfortunately, the notation is somewhat different because instead of uh, talking about two beta, people talk about phi sub S, some people talk about minus two beta sub s, and they are all the same quantities. It's really just the same kind of phase difference between the direct decay and mixing and decay. And this is now measured by LHCB to be something like So the central value, as expected, is 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 much is is, is much much smaller than there. 
And within statistical uncertainties, there is no evidence yet for this type of CP violation being non-zero in the B sub S system. But the interesting thing is that the uncertainties just from run one at the LHC have become comparable to what the B factories could measure. So let me see if I... I did not have this problem the last several days. Sorry, I, I thought that I put a plot in here, but I did not, so never mind. Um, so that's one class of measurements which uh, will certainly continue both in the B sub D and the B sub S systems. We know that the theoretical uncertainties is at least a factor of few times smaller than the current measurements. But if you are thinking forward, sort of 10 years in the future, these measurements could become just by scaling with statistics an order of magnitude more precise. And that level, there is certainly a lot to do for a theorist to really be able to utilize the experimental sensitivity that's going to be achieved. And in some sense, there are lots of ways to recycling the same ideas and the, by doing different measurements which are sensitive to different new physics. So here, the point was that these are three-level decays. So new physics in these measurements could enter BB by a mixing, but it's exceedingly unlikely to, to enter in the decay amplitudes because these are uh, three-level decays in the standard model. The CKM elements are not particularly small, so it's very unlikely for a new physics to be able to compete with the standard model description of the decays themselves. They could affect the mixing. Now, one can do similar kind of measurements also in final states where these decays themselves, A and A bar, are dominated by penguin diagrams, by loop processes. And the goal of that is to try to search for a new physics now in the decay amplitude. So if I, if I look at some final state, which is, uh, which is dominantly coming from a B meson by some loop process, then in that CPA symmetry measurement, Q over P would be the same as it is in B to J psi K short. But if I compare this result with some other result where now new physics could enter the decay amplitudes, then I get some interesting constraints on possible new physics contributions. And again, the simplest example, and there are lots of uh, different cases, is B sub D goes to phi K short. So I just replace the J psi by a phi. And so the quark level process here is B to S, S by S, right? And then the K short just inherits the spectator quark from the B meson. And you cannot draw a three-level diagram for, for this process. So again, I'm kind of a, a little bit loosely speaking, but now the dominant contributions to these decays are coming from penguin diagrams. So you, again, I have up chime and top in these loops with the W. So this can make a, so this is the D quirk. So this can make a phi K short final state. And the analysis is, 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 is exactly the same as here, except that I don't have the tree contribution. So, and of course, these penguin amplitudes for this process are totally different. The matrix elements are different than they are here, but I'm nevertheless going to use the same notation just because, because that's what people do in the literature and because we are running out of letters, unfortunately. That's kind of a problem in the field. So, I can still use CKM unitarity to write VTB times VTS star, which comes with PT, as minus VCB VCS star minus VUB VUS star. So I'm going to end up with basically the exact same expression. Let me put a prime on this, just so not to confuse you. So these are different P's than if they are over there, but the structure is exactly the same.
And again, I can still st tell you the same story that the first term is, is, is of whether the Kabibo angle is squared in absolute value. This is of whether sinus theta Kabibo to the fourth. Now, in that case, I could argue that the first term had a larger matrix element because it had a tree contribution and loop contributions. Now, both of these come only from some loop level process. So the naive expectation would be that this matrix element, which is not the same as that guy, but it should be comparable. There shouldn't be a large hierarchy between, between, the, between, between this matrix element and that matrix element. And then again, I find, so this is the amplitude for this process, whatever it's, I shouldn't write equal, it's really proportional to the matrix element of some terms that have this structure in the effective Hamiltonian. And so this term is still expected to be dominate over the second term by a factor of uh, 20 or so, so one over sine squared theta kabibo. And so everything we said here, so Q over P, of course, is exactly the same as in this case. And now A by over A, instead of uh, the second term being of order 1% or less compared to the first term, here I would expect this to be of order 4 or 5% or less. So still, uh, everything we said over there is going to be valid over here. So these time-dependent CPA symmetries should also measure sine 2 beta. And the only difference is that, uh, let me just write it this way, that the corrections will go like the Kabibo angle squared, so they are expected to be something like 4 or 5%, instead of being at the sub percent level. And, and again, the reason this is interesting is because what you are testing here, so there's the same BB by a mixing process, but now these loop amplitudes could easily receive new physics contributions that would introduce new, new phases in the decay amplitudes that could introduce a difference between these CPA symmetries and sine 2 beta measured in B2J psi k short. So this has been done for a number of final states, and that's uh, the heavy flavor averaging uh, group's uh, average of all the different measurements. So B2 phi k zero, so the, it's, it's written as phi k zero because people do this, or so experimentalists do this both for phi k short and phi k long, and that's averaged, and that's what's called phi k zero. And you see that this very narrow band that's the sine to beta measurement from J psi k short. And in many modes, which in the standard model are dominated by these kind of penguin amplitudes, you see that the results are completely consistent with all of these measurements, measuring the same uh, CPA symmetry that is the same phase difference between these different kind between the two different ways of getting from an initial B0 or B0 bar to this final state. And that gives you constraints on, actually both on, I mean the overall consistency gives you constraints on new physics in BB by mixing, and the relative spread of these measurements constrain new physics contribution in this type of penguin decays. Any questions? Excuse me. And sort of the possibilities in, 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 in sort of, I don't want to say playing these games because people, I mean, experimentally spend years of their lives doing these measurements, but there are really lots of final states where you can use the same method to get uh, interesting information about short distance physics. Um, so maybe I just want to say a few words that if you could do a measurement which is not B to CC by S or B to SS by S, but if you take a process which is, B2, which is dominated by B to UU by D, so then you would get a phase of VUB, VUD star, and this could be achieved, for example, if you study the time-dependent rate of B sub D goes to pi plus pi minus, or rho plus rho minus, now, then these, measure, these measurements would now 
pick up both the phase from Q over P. In the standard convention, this the dominant phase here, the dominant weak phase here. So in the standard convention, I hate being convention dependent, but it's, a, it's, it's simple to think about it that way, that the weak phase of this is very small in the, in, in, in the, in the convention that everyone uses. If you have some process which is dominated by B to U decay, then in addition, in addition to the mixing phase, you would pick up the phase of VUB. So this was the side which is VUB, VUD star divided by VCB, VCD star, or it's complex conjugate. I can never remember which, but uh, up to assign the phase of VUB in the standard convention is gamma. So if, if you do the same measurements in these decays, then you would get a measurement of actually beta, which is connected to the phase of Q over P, plus gamma, which is connected to the phase of A by over A. And this is kind of opening a, a Pandora's box, because what happens for these processes is that you have B to U, so there is your D by a quark, so U by a D, so this would be a pi plus, this would be a pi minus, and the penguin diagrams, which is B to D, I think that there's probably a 1% chance that I'll get this right. So this is a pi minus, that's a pi plus. So the subtlety in this case is that the, the tree diagram now comes with a phase which is VUB, VUD. And the order of magnitude of that is lambda cubivo cubed. The penguin diagrams go like VTB, VTD. And the order of magnitude of that is again the cubivo angle cubed. So the big difference between these kind of processes and these ones is that there is no hierarchy in the CKM elements between the contributing amplitudes. So as a result, there was, so you can no longer say that this is a clean measurement of something because now you have several contributions to the amplitude which have different weak phases. And there is really a huge amount of literature using isospin symmetry and other theoretical methods how you can nevertheless disentangle the strong interaction physics from the weak interactions here. So if, 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 if any of you have seen that or want to ask me questions about it, then, then, then we should talk about it later. I, I don't think I want to say more about it. That there's sort of a, a smooth transition between theoretically very clean processes. Well, at least in the last 10, 20 years, there was very little for a theorist to do because you know from first principles that the theoretical uncertainties were negligible compared to the experimental reach. To measurements, well, even 10, 15 years ago, people knew that you have to work harder to, to, to understand sufficiently or come up with some tricks to, 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 to understand processes which at first sight seem like untractable because, because there is no hierarchy between the contributing amplitudes. Another case which is very important, and I won't have time to explain it, but I want to mention it, so there's something special about direct measurements of the CKM angle gamma. So if you look at the definition of gamma, it is the only angle of the unitarity triangle which does not involve the top quark. And as a result of that, so if you look at the definition of what beta is, there is whatever, be, CKM elements involving the top quark enter here. And so if you want to measure either alpha or beta, you can sort of immediately see from the definitions of those angles that the top quark is somehow directly involved. And that tells you that you can, in any process involving B mesons or K mesons or D mesons, you can only access that through loop diagrams, which can, in principle, be affected by new physics. On the contrary, gamma only depends on quarks which can be on shell in a B decay. And in fact, there are 
ways to measure gamma entirely from three-level processes. And that's going to be important for what I want to say next, that uh, so, so, so getting a three-level determination of the CKM matrix is going to play a special role in, 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 in constraining new physics. And I'll, I'll say a few more words about that in a minute. So I just want to give you the idea that what happens here is that so, so, so the measurements of gamma, contrary to those cases, come primarily for, from charged B decays. So you're looking at B plus or B minus decays to particular final states. And it's really a different, uh, so yeah, so, hmm. so let me just draw things for a moment. So these are Ws, so this is like a, just a four, usual four Fermi interaction. So this is B minus D zero by K minus. So the, the basic idea is that, so if you look at, for example, B minus decays, then there's a B to C transition where you, end, where you can end up with a final state that is D0, K minus, and you can take the suppressed B to U transition, and you can end up with a B minus decaying to D0 bar and K minus. Now, these are different final states, so what I'm talking about, but nevertheless, they can interfere because D0 and D0 bar also mix, just like k0 and k0 bar gives you k short and k long, where b0 and b0 bar gives you b light and b heavy. Those are just labels of the mass eigenstates being mixtures of the CP eigenstates. So similarly here, the, the d0 and the d0 bar mix with one another, and therefore these two different processes can in fact end up with the same final states, giving in interference which, between these two diagrams, which will allow you to measure the CKM angle gamma. And I am happy to take any questions, but I wasn't going to say more about it because the details are really kind of quite comp So the punchline is that there are several methods in this domain as well to control, to, to, to have the theoretical uncertainties under very good control, but it's kind of different than over there. But it's very important that you can measure gamma cleanly from three level processes without any involvement of neutral meson mixing. Any questions? So why am I telling you all this? It's a good question. The reason is that uh, so you go back to the first plot I had. So if you look at all these constraints on the CKM matrix, so we said that you can measure gamma, which is this gray wedge from three level processes. You can determine VUB, the magnitude of the B to U CKM element from three level processes that's done from semi-leptonic decays. But if you look at everything else on this plot, the measurement of sine two beta, Epsilon k, the CP violation parameter in KK biomixing, where the measurement of alpha from this type of processes. So all the other things besides gamma and VUB come from loop level processes, where if you have TEV scale new physics, that could certainly influence the result of these measurements. So if you're asking how well do these measurements constrain new physics, then the fit is really not this fit that you should be performing, this fit assumes the standard model, and it assumes in particular that all loop diagrams as well as tree diagrams are dominated by just the standard model contributions that is integrating out the top quark and the W boson, the Z boson, etc. So, so one of the interesting questions you can ask, which is actually, so in a lot of new physics models, it will remain true that 
what shall I write? Lots of models have the properties that the 3 by 3 CKM matrix remains unitary. And three level processes, meaning a three level in the standard model, are dominated by the standard model contributions themselves. And that's just from the sort of the well justified conventional wisdom that you expect new physics not to be new physics to be at a heavier mass scale than the weak scale and therefore it would be new much much easier for new physics to compete in loop processes than in three level processes and one very simple way to parameterize the effect of uh, such new physics on these measurements is just to assume that m12 so whatever in each meson system so uh, M12 separately for the K, D, B sub S, and B sub D system. I could parameterize it as M12 for that particular system in the standard model, so I should put some other index on it, but uh, we'll get dizzy of indices. And so this is the standard model piece. And the new physics piece will have a magnitude that I will call H, and it has a phase which I will call sigma. So I have been completely general. We saw in the first lecture that when you describe neutral meson mixing, to determine the mass difference and the width difference and to determine the phase of Q over P, which affects all these CP violation measurements, what really matters is this off-diagonal element M12. If you remember, that relied just on the assumption that M12 is much less than gamma 1,2. Sorry, the other way around. And certainly you would expect new physics to maintain this because new physics is again unlikely to contribute to gamma 1, 2. So, so one of the interesting things where you can say fairly general things about a large class of models is that if I just assume that new physics essentially comes as an effective modification of BB by B sub S, B sub S by DD by KK by mixing, and I can ask the question, how well can I constrain that? So what happens in that case is that the measurements of gamma would still measure essentially the phase in this combination of CKM elements. The magnitudes of the CKM elements would be unaffected because they come mostly from semi-leptonic decays. And However, BB by mixing, which gives this constraint with these rings, and epsilon k, and sine 2 beta, and alpha, they can all be affected. So if you do that, then you end up with a much more complicated fit, not surprisingly. There are new parameters in the fit, this h and sigma parameters. And therefore, you expect the constraints to be less good, because you have more parameters to fit. And the result of that exercise so this is a, some plots from the CKM Fitter group, is that, for example, if you ask how big can this new physics contribution in B sub D mixing be, then sort of just ignore the plot on the left. That's just for historical interest that, you know, 10 years ago, new physics could be bigger than the standard model in BB biomixing. Right now, the constraints are that new physics, that, so the vertical axis is the phase of new physics, this parameter sigma. The horizontal axis is the magnitude of uh, new physics in BB biomixing, that is H. And the constraints are kind of at the 20, 30 percent level, and not surprisingly, the value of sigma affects how good the constraints are on, 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 on the magnitude itself. And you can directly translate these kind of uh, fit results to the possible scale of new physics. So if you, assume, if you assume that new physics just contributes with an operator that uh, I can parameterize as some Wilson coefficient over some scale of new physics times b by left gamma mu d left. So this is the same as the standard model operator responsible for BB by mixing, but it has a 
some arbitrary coefficient coming from new physics and it is suppressed by new some new physics scale rather than the weak scale, then you can translate these constraints on H to the possible combination of this coupling over the scale of new physics square. And again, depending on whether the new physics has the same kind of uh, CKM suppressions and loop suppressions, you find that the result is at the several TeV scale. And even in the case, even if you assume that new physics has the same CKM suppression and loop suppression as the standard model, you still find that sort of you're in the ballpark of, for example, uh, so, so one way, in, for example, in the MSSM, how BB biomixing could be affected is like square gluino box diagrams. And the mass scale that you are indirectly probing here is at the TeV scale, which is kind of comparable to the gluino masses probed by the LHC. Yes? Yeah, so I... Uh, uh, Yeah, sorry, I'm paging on the wrong one. Sorry. Yeah, so rho bar and eta bar refer to a modification of the usual Wolfenstein parametrization. Well, you, I don't have it anywhere. So the usual Wolfenstein parametrization is this expansion in the Kabibu angle to third order. And rho bar and eta bar is a modification of that parametrization such that it maintains unitarity exactly. So it's very close to rho and eta. The difference is starts at order lambda kabibo to the fourth and higher orders. And it's used in these fits by both the CKM fitter and the UT fit group, which are the two big groups performing these CKM fits, because then you don't have to worry about approximations of the CKM matrix. So you just get another parametrization which is exactly unitary. And, and that's nicer because you don't need to think about whether the neglected terms are really negligible or not. So, does the... Any other questions? So this is approximately how far I wanted to get yesterday. And what I wanted to... So I'm going to sort of slightly switch topics and use the remainder of today to tell you about some, basically about heavy quark effective theory and some ways how to uh, address some of the hadronic physics which is relevant for understanding these phenomena. And yeah, so these are the different sine to beta measurements. Right, so this may be mission impossible, but what I would like to get, so, so recently there is quite some excitement about, so let me just tell you about what, the, what, what that plot is, and then maybe in half an hour later we'll get to understand why those predictions are kind of fairly reliable, which is what I would like to do. So about three years ago, the Bobaya collaboration reported some interesting measurements of this quantity, so R is defined as uh, the, de uh, the decay rate of B to D tau nu divided by the average of B to D and the, either an electron or a muon. So let me just call it, um, I'm going to call it electron. So it's the average of electron and muon, neutrino. And similarly, I star is the same quantity for a d star tau nu divided by, again, the average of the electron, the muon, and the neutrino. And so this generated quite some excitement because the Bobaya measurement was the black ellipse, which was reported to be more than three sigma away from the standard model, which is roughly that green box. And it was in less than a month ago that the Bell experiment uh, published their measurement at a conference, which is the blue ellipse. And at the same time, LHCB could also do one of these measurements. 
So now you see that you end up with these observables with a funny situation that there seems to be a kind of significant tension with the standard model. Again, I don't want to jump to conclusions because obviously these measurements will be done a lot better, but it's kind of intriguing. And historically, the interest in these decays were motivated by the fact that, for example, if you are in, 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 in the two Higgs doublet model, the sort of the type 2 2 Higgs doublet model which you have in the MSSM, for example, then you could have contributions to the numerator that kind of are enhanced by tangent beta square, where tangent beta is the ratio of, okay, well, I, did I, is anyone talking about what I'm talking about? Or should I assume that all of you know about the MSSM? So, so, tan so in, in, the, in the MSSM, there has to be two Higgs doublets. Tangent beta is the ratio between the two webs. There are motivated regions of parameter space where tangent beta is large. And the final state with the tau mass could be enhanced by charged Higgs contributions. So sort of just these diagrams. Well, of course, now this coupling would be proportional to the tau mass. And this coupling could be proportional to the bottom mass, or the bottom you cover. So there is a term which goes like mb m tau over the charged Higgs mass square. And it has this possible enhancement by tangent beta. And historically, people have talked about tangent beta possibly being quite large, 20, 30, or more. So even if, uh, you know, if, even if, if the charged Higgs mass is at several hundred GeV, this was an interesting uh, scenario that people have talked about for a long time that could manifest itself by giving different results than the standard model, because in the standard model you only have this diagram with a W exchange, and of course the W couples universally to the tau and the electron and the muon. So, so that's just the motivation of uh, one of the things that, that hopefully we can understand how the theoretical predictions are made and, and, and should you believe any of this? You know, is that, is that green box as big as it's drawn in that plot, or is it 10 times larger? And to be honest, I think that the other reason I wanted to tell you a little bit about heavy quark symmetry is because really it's one of the sort of the nicest examples where these effective theory ideas both work in practice and, and, and they are useful experimentally. And also there is sort of a hand-waving understanding of what it is that simplifies the QCD dynamics. And it's not even cheating when one waves their hands. And that's kind of an unusual case. So, so you want to know that if you plot the strong coupling, alpha s of mu, as a function of the scale mu, then the coupling is strong at uh, low energies or long distances, and, and, and strong interactions become perturbative at high energy or short distances. And you could ask the question, in what cases do we know? Uh, at least if I ask myself the question in principle, what are the ways to make sort of rigorous predictions from, from, from QCD, then of course there is the, in some ways, the simplest example where, where perturbation theory holds, and that's a lot of things that Michelangelo talked about, that if you are calculating some 100 GeV or TeV scale process of some decay of some particle, then you can just go to higher order in perturbation theory and calculate higher and higher loops in the perturbation expansion. And because the coupling is small, it should give you a good approximation to the result. Of course, you should remember that all of these expansions are asymptotic. And actually, that's an important story that is in the background. For example, when Michelangelo talked about the relationship between the top quark pole mass and the MS biomass, and he mentioned that for the B quark mass, once you go to three loop and four loop, then the perturbation series doesn't appear to converge anymore. So you know that all asymptotic series at some point start to blow up. 
And for the top quark, that doesn't appear to be an issue yet at for loop. So that even in perturbation theory, the one should be aware of subtleties that this is none of these are convergent expansions. They are at best asymptotic. And so one of the other cases that we saw is, is, is using symmetries. And I would put this example of B to J psi K short that we spent a lot of time on into this, into this category because what really happens is that if you, what we were using, and I'm sorry, I'm just using, I, I can't write J psi. I, I always write psi, I'm sorry. So, so in some sense, all the simplifications that we have talked about just come from the simple, from the CP invariance of QCD that we could derive that the matrix element of B0 to Psi K short is the same as B by 0 to Psi K short with some quantifiable accuracy that goes like lambda C squared times what we call penguin over 3. But essentially, what we have used is some symmetry of QCD, namely CP invariance of QCD. And there's this other example of uh, when, when you can use effective theories, like heavy quark effective theory, which is, which, is, which, is, which is some limit of QCD. And we'll see that if you take the limit that MB and MC are treated as much greater than lambda QCD, then there will be some new symmetries of strong interactions that emerge that can be used to understand some matrix elements in a model independent manner that will be relevant for that story. It's also relevant for the determination of, of, of for example, the CKM element VCB, that VCB can be determined model independently because you can use HQET to derive re relations for the decay rates and you can quantify the uncertainties in some cases to be suppressed by two powers of the hadronic scale over the heavy quark mass. And there's another important point that I, so in each of these cases, except for you know, in perturbation theory, theory in, the, in some sense the higher order term, sort of your uncertainty goes like alpha s to some power and you need to worry whether the scale is really the nominal scale of some of the highest energy scale that occurs in a process, or somehow the physics gives rise to lower scales that could make this expansion worse. But in all of these cases, the name of the game is quite often how you estimate the next order term that you have not computed. What is the theoretical uncertainty in any of these predictions? And I think it's very important to remember that in many, that, that you know, having an expansion in some parameter that is small is, 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 is almost never enough. The, 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 there's always some experimental guidance that's needed to see how well uh, each of these expansions work. And, and the reason is because we always kind of just guess what is the scale of the suppression of, of, of the next term. And sort of an, a nice example is that if you look at the pion decay constant, that's 140 MeV. The row mass is 770 MeV. And if I take Mk square over Ms, so the k on mass over the strange quark mass, that's also of where the lambda QCD, but numerically it's 2 GeV. So, and okay, so this is, you know that the k on is, so the, the, the Pseudo-scalar octets are pseudo-Goldstone bosons, right, of the spontaneously broken chiral symmetry. And whatever, mk square formally goes like whether ms times lambda qcd. And that's why mk square over ms is formally of whether lambda qcd, which you would expect to be a few hundred MeV. But sometimes you can get large enhancements. And unless you understand the physics really to one higher order than we talk about, it's, it, it's, it's very often only experimental data which can tell you whether your expansion is 
better behaved or whether there is some fluke enhancement of something that we would really have not expected from just the power counting of the expansion. Any questions? So, so heavy quark symmetry, or, or, or so if you have a beam as on, so we are trying to use the argument, whatever, the, the separation of scales that the B quark mass is much greater than the typical scale of QCD interactions. So a B meson, if you wish, has a characteristic size, which is one over lambda QCD, and that's the scale on which strong interactions take place. At the same time, the Compton wavelengths of the B quark itself is of order of one over MB. So this physical picture that there's this heavy B quark which sort of sits in this B meson is really a good approximation even though there's sort of very complicated uh, dynamics that uh, takes place because of confinement. So here you have QQ by pairs, you have the spectator quark, you have gluons, and we really don't understand in detail the dynamics of what's happening. But you know that the scale and the characteristic wavelengths of the exchanged gluons is very different than the scale of the heavy quark mass. And so, so the physical picture is really very much uh, similar to atomic physics, that you can think of the B quark as sort of in the B meson rest frame, the B quark has to be almost at rest. And it's really not perturbed in any significant way by these strong interactions between the light degrees of freedom that confine this to a B meson. And there's a way to formalize all of this. So one usually, so, so it's convenient to introduce the Fourier velocity of the B meson, which is just B over M. And so because of this physical picture, and there's actually so formal ways to derive it, that, so, so there are two important predictions, is that, that the spin of the B quark interacting with the light degrees of freedom. So this has to be a suppressed interaction. And sort of if you think about the hydrogen atom, there is an exact analogy to this that that the hyperfine splitting, which comes from the interactions of the nucleon spin with the electron spin in the hydrogen atom, that's also a subleading interaction. And the other, so this is usually called spin symmetry. Because it tells you that at leading order, whether the B quark spin in some arbitrary direction points up or points down, does not change the dynamics of, 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 of this system. If you have more than one heavy quarks, then I can imagine having some weak current which changes this B quark to a chime quark, some different mass, which is still, from the point of view of this system, is just like a point-like source of uh, color of QCD interaction, just like in the hydrogen atom, the nucleon the nucleus is, 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 is a static electric source. This is a static color source. So again, at leading order, if you change the heavy quark mass, so it's, for example, you change MB to MC by having a weak interaction, giving rise to, a, for example, a semi-leptonic B decay to a B quark to C quark and the lepton and the neutrino, then to a good approximation, these light degrees of freedom are not affected by the change in the heavy quark mass. In some sense, the only thing that they care about is the velocity of this heavy quark. And again, sort of the, 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 the atomic physics analog of this is that isotopes have a very similar chemistry because I just put one more neutron in the so, yeah, so just look at the different isotope and the electron wave functions to a leading order are not affected by this. And
So, so far I, 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 I am mostly waving my hands, but there is a way to, to, to derive an effective theory that formalizes all of this. And, 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 and that actually becomes quite predictive for, for example, for semi-leptonic B decays. It also allows you to understand the spectroscopy of these B mesons. So, am I doing this? So, so what happens in these systems is so okay. So, so if you look at what is the So the total angular momentum, of course, of a hadron is, is, is a conserved quantity, right? That, and, and, and so that commutes with the Hamiltonian. And in these systems, you can write the total angular momentum as sort of the spin of the B quark plus the spin of the light degrees of freedom. Well, the spin of the light degrees of freedom for me contain the spins of the quarks, and it also contain a possible orbital angular momenta, whatever. And I argued here that the spin of the heavy quark is not going to affect the dynamics of this system. So at leading order, the spin of the heavy quark is also a conserved quantity. And because of the total angular momentum, it's just the spin of the B quark plus the light degrees of freedom that also tells you that the light degrees of freedom in these systems have a total spin that is conserved. And so this looks like a totally trivial set of statements, but the result is that I can, so, so, so you know, you have, you have, you have I, I have an arbitrarily, I, I don't know what is the, so at the quark model, there is the B quark and the spectator quark, but there are QQ by pairs, there are gluons, there is orbital angular momentum. So the spin of the light degrees of freedom can be a whole, there is a whole tower of possibilities. But for any value of the spin of the light degrees of freedom, there will be two states coming from the B quark spin, which is one half, either adding or subtracting from that. So So in the B system, there will be the two lighter states, the B and the B star. So the B star is an angular momentum one state. This is an angular momentum zero state. And they will correspond to the spin of the light degrees of freedom being a half. So you get a spin zero state and a spin one state. And there is sort of a tower of such states Well. There are some levels which are split to two states because you either, when you combine the light degrees of freedom with the B quark, you can, you, can, you can get one of two levels. So the next one is usually called in the B system, it's called, so this is the B, which is whatever its mass is 5.28 GeV. This guy is at 5.32. I, then there is an, an excited state of a B, which is a B1, 5.72. So this is a spin one state. There's a spin two state, which is observed at 5.74. And the point is that this spacing, which is the different light quark spins, I have where the lambda QCD, but the level splitting in each of these doublets is of order lambda QCD square divided by the heavy quark mass. And similarly here, the exact value is not the same, but the power counting is such that these are several hundred MeV and these splittings are tens of MeV. And you can immediately make several predictions because you can look at the same thing in the D system. In the D system, the ground state is whatever, the D meson, which is a pseudo scalar. There is the D star, which is the analog of the B star. And the next 
doublet of states is the D1, which is 2.42 GeV. It will become in a, a clear in a moment why I'm writing all this down. The D2 star is 2.46. And so now this splitting, just like there, it's of order lambda QCD over M chime in this case. So you see that, for example, one prediction from heavy quark symmetry will be that MB star minus MB divided by MD star minus MD should be the same as the ratio of the chime quark to the bottom quark mass. And experimentally, that seems to work quite well. I mean, here you have a mass difference of something like close to 50 MeV. Here you have a mass difference of 140 MeV. And the ratio of, uh, of, of, a bit of, of 50 MeV to 140 MeV is indeed in the ballpark of MC over MB. And of course, this relation has corrections, which are now of order of the QCD scale over either M chime or M bottom. So the prediction, so you, so, so, so you have an expansion in some, at least in some formal limit, small parameter. Lambda QCD over MB is something like 0.1. Lambda QCD over M chime is not so small. It's of order 0.3. And this is what I mentioned before, that one has to test empirically whether, whether an expansion in a parameter like 0.3, does that make sense or does that not make sense? And it seems that in these cases, that works quite well. So there is immediately some understanding of of, of, uh, so, so there's essentially a big tower of these states, and of course these heavier states decay with strong interaction. But it's important that from the point of view of heavy quark symmetry, there are these doublets of states with spins one unit apart that have strong interaction properties which are closely related to each other by heavy quark symmetry. Any questions? So the way you can make all of this formal, and this is really just the hand-waving arguments at leading order, is that you can write down an effective theory which allows you to do actual calculations. It also allows you to go to subleading order. And sort of heavy quark, effect, heavy quark effective theory was really the example that was then later sort of recycled for a soft collinear effective theory. And it's the foundation of uh, many of the factorization based methods in, in, in heavy quark physics. So, so I can write the, so, so let's just take, instead of M, uh, the label B, I will use a label capital Q for a heavy quark. So I can write, so again, let me just say a few words about how heavy quark effective theory works, or how, what, what, what the effective theory is. So I can write the momentum of the heavy quark as MBV plus some residual momentum. And the goal of this uh, exercise is that I want to separate the physics that scales like this large parameter, the heavy quark mass in the problem. And somehow I want to remove that piece and be left with sort of the dynamics only depend on these residual momenta and, uh, and, and, and parts of the physics which in the heavy quark limit is constant and, and, and does not scale with the heavy quark mass. So I want to separate out the pieces which scale somehow with the heavy quark mass from the terms that do not. Because I know that soft QCD interactions will relate, so the part of the physics which is non-perturbative 
cannot scale with the heavy quark mass. And I somehow want to get a handle on that. So PQ square is obviously you square this plus 2MQ V dot K plus K square. And if you look at what is the propagator of a heavy quark, so it's just I over PQ slash minus MQ. And you can write this as, so I multiply and divide by PQ slash plus MQ. Then it's MQ V slash plus K plus MQ. Right, so in the denominator MQ squared disappears. And therefore, and in the numerator I have used PQ slash plus MQ and PQ slash is just this. So again, to separate out the terms which are big and which are not big in the heavy quark limit, this is, so you, you look at what are the terms that go like MQ. So this is just one plus V slash over two times I over V dot K. And I can neglect the terms which are subleading in the heavy quark limit. And what you see is that instead of a usual quark propagator, which has some Dirac structure and depends on the heavy quark mass, you end up with this heavy quark propagator which is now manifestly independent of the heavy quark mass. MQ has disappeared from the propagator of this heavy quark. And similarly, so if one usually so this, this, let me go one step further. If you ask what is the coupling of a gluon to a heavy quark, then of course, in full QCD, this is, uh, G strong gamma mu times the generator lambda E over two. And this one plus V slash over two, it's, 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 it's a, project on op a projection operator. So, so if I define P plus as one plus V slash over two, then it has the property that P plus square is equal to P plus. That's what, projectors are, and, and sort of the, the, the interpretation of this is that if you are in the B quark rest frame, that then in the B quark rest frame, one plus V slash over two is nothing else but a half times one plus gamma zero. And and, 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 and the half one plus gamma zero projects in the rest frame of a quark on the particle rather than the antiparticle components of the four component spinner. So, so this propagator has, so this one plus V slash over two has the interpretation of projecting out at leading order the particle rather than the antiparticle components of the, of the heavy quark field. So, because the propagator has this structure, you can also show that, so in, in this coupling, the, this interaction is surrounded by this heavy quark propagator that sometimes people use a double line notation to distinguish from a light quark propagator. And you can show that P plus gamma mu P plus is the same as V mu times P plus so you just have to commute through the gamma mu with the V. And that means that the gluon coupling to a heavy quark simplifies. So the Feynman rules for that is just going to be IG slash V mu lambda A over two. And now there's again something funny happening that there's no Dirac matrix in the coupling of a gluon to a heavy quark at leading order in, the, in, the, in this effective theory. And this is just a manifestation of the fact that, that the gluons, sort of soft gluons, 
are independent of the heavy quark spin. What is the spin of this fermion does not affect at all the interaction with soft gluons. And so one can make all of this uh, very formal, I mean, from the QCD Lagrangian, which is just ID slash minus MQ, Q, you can introduce new heavy quark fields, which take the large momentum components out of this full QCD fields, and you can write down the HQET Lagrangian and, 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 if, and if you want, there is like a f whole formalism that is worked out to subleading order. But the physics is just what we said, that you want to separate the large and small m momentum components of what's uh, happening in, in, in these interactions. Now, how does that affect semi-leptonic decays? And we care about semi-leptonic decays because of this current anomaly in, in, in one case, and also because historically decays like B to D or B to D star, just electron neutrino, were very important for determining the CKM element VCB. It's also a testing ground for this effective theory. And So what happens in, uh, hmm. so, I, so I wanted to explain that this heavy quark limit gives very important simplifications for these semi decays as well. Well, again, a priori, it is some non-perturbative dynamics that determine the matrix elements for these transitions. So let me just give you an example. So, so if you look at B to D decay, then the hadronic matrix element you are interested in is a D meson with some momentum, and you have uh, some uh, current. So you are interested in this matrix element, right? This is, a, this is the B to C semi-leptonic current the part of the current which involves the electron and the neutrino that does not have a, that, that does not participate in strong interactions so in some sense it's trivial and you want to parameterize these matrix elements and it turns out that for this particular case where it's b to d it's only the vector part of the current which uh, has a non-zero matrix element and in general that can be parameterized by some function, F plus, and the only thing which is Lorentz invariant, so there's an initial momentum and the final momentum, and you can, whatever, Q square is, always, is defined as P minus P prime square, and that's the only Lorentz invariant quantity you can construct from P and P prime, other than just P square and P prime square, which are just the masses of these particles. So there are going to be some, fun some functions which can depend on whatever they are allowed to depend on, which in this case is only Q square. And the, the sort of Lorentz invariance tells you that there are two possibilities. It either depends on a P mu plus P prime mu, or there could be another term, which is F minus of Q square times P mu minus P prime mu. And you can write down sort of a similar, similar parameterization of the matrix element for a B to D star transition as well, which is more complicated because in that case, both the vector and the axial current contribute. And the physics of, the, of, 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 of these decays is that if you think about it, so, so, so there's this B meson which has the B quark in the B, in the B meson rest frame, 
There's the B quark and it's surrounded by this light degrees of freedom that sometimes people refer to as brown muck. And there's this weak current which instantaneously changes the, well, at, at a distance, at, 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 on a time scale much uh, shorter than the characteristic time scale of QCD interactions, changes the B quark to a charm quark. And heavy quark symmetry gives you a number of relations between these form factors that describe these matrix elements. So in B2D, there are these two form factors in full QCD. In B2D star lepton neutrino case, the, uh, I'm not going to write it out explicitly, the four form factors that parameterize the hadronic physics. And I will uh, think about it, whether I come back to this tomorrow or not. The point is that, that these six functions you can show from heavy quark symmetry to be related, to be given by just one universal function of Q square. So instead of six functions of Q square, there is only one function that, uh, that, that all the hadronic physics only depends on, 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 on one function instead of six function, and that directly comes from heavy quark symmetry because it's a consequence of the fact that the D and the D star from the point of view of heavy quark symmetry, they are a part of the same doublet. And so, whether you have a vector current or an axial current, whether the final state or a D or a D star, in some sense, there are symmetry relations between these matrix elements. And that has been, historically, the, 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 one of the ways how uh, the VCBCKM element was determined, and it is also crucial for understanding these predictions because, so in, in B to D star, there are four form factors. Okay, I should say one more thing that in the case of the electron or the muon, you can immediately see that this piece, which goes like P minus P prime, vanishes for a massless lepton, right? Because if you are, if, you are, if, 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 if P minus P prime is between the electron and the neutrino spinner, then for massless leptons, that term vanishes. So, in fact, the only difference between massive and massless leptons is that in, in the B2D case, one of the form factors does not contribute for an electron or a muon, and similarly here for the D star, for the electron and muon final state, when the lepton mass is negligible, there are only three form factors that contribute. But the point is that all of this is very, very precisely measured by, so, 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 so experimentalists have done extremely precise measurements with the B2D star electron neutrino and the D electron neutrino form factors, which by heavy quark symmetry are related to the same function. This is what uh, people call the isgur weiss function, and there are 1 over m corrections to this description that violate heavy quark symmetry, and it can be parametrized. But these four form factors describe this full angular distribution of the decay to this final state, and you see that the theoretical description and the data is completely consistent with one another. So the point is that this way heavy quark symmetry allows us, so it, it gives us relations that the pieces that you need to know to make a prediction for the tau final state, which is, so in the B to D case, you measure this form factor and you are not sensitive to this one, but the form factor that is not measured is related by heavy quark symmetry to the one that is measured and similarly in the D star case. And as a result of that, to make a prediction for these ratios, the theoretical uncertainty is really quite small because in some sense the hadronic physics is measured 
by doing the measurements of the decay distributions of these terms in the denominator, if we're an electron and the muon final state, and the extra ingredient, the extra, extra form factor, the extra hadronic matrix element that contributes to the numerators of these terms, is related by heavy quark symmetry to, the, to things that, that people have already measured. So, so that's really the basis for making theoretical predictions for these quantities, and the fact, and, 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 and the result of that is, uh, so actually people have gone through this exercise, put in the subleading terms, which are somehow parametrized and also constrained from the data, and that yield the pr predictions that uh, this ratio for the D case is supposed to be near 0.3, and for the D star case, it's supposed to be near 0.25, and even though I call these theoretical predictions to a large extent, it's really just a function of measured objects already. And, you know, where this will take us in the future, I think that uh, that's an open question that uh, I certainly don't know. It, uh, it, 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 it appears like a very unusual place for new physics to show up. This is certainly not how people expected new physics to show up. And uh, if I had to guess, it's premature to do any uh, significant conclusions about this. Nevertheless, it's kind of an intriguing thing that this is what the data says right now. And, and I just wanted to give you a sort of a glimpse of, uh, of, 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 of what the theoretical background is to, to make these predictions. I should say one more thing that this is also a, something which Lattice QCD can do very precisely. And also for the lattice QCD calculations, actually these heavy quark effective theory ideas are extremely useful because it also simplifies the lattice QCD calculations. So I apologize, this I realize was not uh, very well organized, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have. <laughs>